Father God, thank you so very much for giving us this opportunity that we, brothers and sisters, could come together to study your word, O oh Lord. Lord, uh, we ask you for your leading and guidance, and we want to hear your voice, Lord, as we're going to study the topic that Jesus is a prophesied Messiah. We ask you to open our hearts and minds to your revelation and illumination, and we ask you to speak to us through your servant. And the discussions we are going to partake, Lord, may be beneficial to each other and may be acceptable in your sight. And they may edify all of us, Lord. Thank you very much for listening to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And uh, warm welcome to all Ram of you. does not hit. Sorry? Uh, oh, sorry, my daughter. Okay, I thought you were telling me something. <laughs> right. Okay. Well, uh, welcome to uh, Vanessa and Oprakash, who's just joined us. Uh, once again, a pleasure to uh, do this study with all of you today. Uh, you will uh, remember that I had uh, uh, given the subject as uh, the pro promised Messiah. Today, we are going to study the chapter... 53 of the book of Isaiah and uh, there is a controversy about this about this chapter so what I plan to do is address the controversy first uh, I'm presuming most of you will be very familiar with the chapter uh, because it's uh, we Christians believe it's a messianic chapter and then what we'll do is we will read through the entire chapter uh, and what I'll do is I'll pick up some points for uh, for comment and then we'll get into our discussion so that's the format with which we'll follow today um uh, it'll always be good for me to uh bring in uh the powerpoint so i think as we hear and see it will probably be a little bit more effective so give me just a moment as i get into my screen share All right. So that is the chat. That is the um, um, title of for the message. Now, I just wanted to mention that obviously this is not going to be a very intensive study because uh, uh, you know you can take several uh, uh, what do you say a series of uh, messages or Bible studies on this. We don't have the time for that. I want to finish it in this one study. So it will just be a skimming over. Uh, many of the details so uh, but if you should want to uh, you know have any more information on those details feel free to ask and we'll try our best to cover this okay so let's begin with the controversy what's the controversy well the controversy is that when christians read isaiah chapter 53 we read it uh, as you know, we, we recognize that it's a prophetic depiction of the suffering of the Messiah. So Christians believe this is the this is referring to Jesus Christ. Conclusion, Jesus Christ is the Messiah. But the Jews, some Jewish teachers do not agree uh, with the Christian interpretation and belief. Okay, so... What do they believe? They believe that this is speaking of the nation of Israel and specifically the nation of Israel being punished. So they don't want to accept uh, that it is referring to a person. But unfortunately, some believe that it is talking about a person. Uh, and so some of the Jews, some of the scholars tend to recognize it is talking about a person and hence uh, it is messianic but uh, it probably is not Jesus it is uh, someone who suffered but the messiah is will come after that so they talk about two messiahs so because of this controversy between the Jewish people what did have what did they do they called it the forbidden chapter all right. They left it out of their synagogue calendar readings. They didn't want, you know, to expose people to this controversy. They continue to deny Jesus Christ is not the Messiah. 
and he is yet to come even if they believe that this is a person who has suffered but this is not the real messiah so that is how the controversy remains um and i must say that the jews are also very wary of this chapter they don't like uh especially jewish people to read it because many jews who read this chapter have become christians they have put their faith in jesus they believe that yes this is speaking about jesus and hence they have become uh christians and so uh many uh jewish scholars you know try to uh hide this chapter from others at least that is how it is uh, interpreted okay now why do christians believe that this uh refers to jesus christ okay so this is how christians reason they believe it is certainly talking about a person not a nation uh they deny the fact that this is in reference to how the nation is being punished the some of the jewish scholars tend to interpret it as the jewish nation is being punished by god and hence isaiah 53 and or and the uh, poetic form of isaiah 53 and some believe that it is actually a song all right so, but christians deny that and say no it is specific to a person secondly the the chapter very clearly mentions that the suffering is on behalf of sins of others right not for own sins or not for the sins of the nation of israel it is a the the nation of israel is not suffering for its own sins but the individual being mentioned in the chapter is suffering of behalf of others and obviously they connect that up with jesus christ also the chapter believe, uh, says that the suffering is redemptive and hence christians believe only christ suffering can be redemptive and hence this is speaking about jesus and uh, uh, they they categor categorically believe it is talking about jesus jesus himself ascribes this to himself all right so uh luke 22 37 uh it is on your screen let me read it it is written and he was numbered with the transgressors and i tell you that this must be fulfilled in me yes what is written about me is reaching its fulfillment where do you find this quotation and he was numbered with the transgressors it is uh i forgot to yeah isaiah 53 uh, uh, the the 12th uh, verse of Isaiah 53 is therefore uh, is what Jesus is referring to. Let me just read you. Uh, yeah, numbered with the transgressors. So Jesus is picking up a verse from Isaiah 53 and applying it to himself. And so uh, everybody believes that, uh, uh, Christians believe that Jesus Christ is, is the reference person in this chapter. It's interesting to note that the book of Isaiah according to some uh, scholars is one of the most quoted in the gospels in fact some actually would like to say they they term it the fifth gospel <laughs> Isaiah the book of Isaiah being the fifth gospel all right uh, so this is how christians um uh reason with regards to uh, Isaiah 53 okay let me see if uh, uh i i may want to mention i don't have it on the screen i also just want to mention another quotation from uh the gospel of john john 12 i'm reading from verse 37 it says even after jesus had performed so many signs in their presence they still would not believe in him this was to fulfill the word of isaiah the prophet now john is quoting isaiah and what does he quote he says the following lord who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the lord been revealed and this is taken from isaiah 53 so even john quotes isaiah and so uh, the clear uh, you know conclusion is that jesus is the uh, 
uh, person referred to in Isaiah 53. One more thought on this, and this is I'm going to uh, Acts chapter 8. You will remember the story of Philip and the Ethiopian, the eunuch. Uh, let me read to you uh, what is on the screen, beginning in verse 32. This is the passage of scripture the eunuch was reading. I'm not, uh, I'm sure you're familiar with the story, so I'm not going into the story. The eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. Verse 33, in his humili humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. Verse 34, the eunuch asked Philip, tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? The answer, then Philip began, with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. And where is this passage found? Isaiah 53, right? So uh, uh, the New Testament is absolutely clear with regards to who the uh, person referred to in Isaiah 53 is. So this is why we believe that Jesus is the Messiah written in Isaiah 53. Now, let us look at the larger context of the book of Isaiah, and then we will get into the actual reading of the chapter. The larger context of Isaiah. Now, once again, there are subcontexts, and I'm not going into all of that. Uh, I am uh, eliminating all of that. I'm just giving you the broader picture. The first thing we have to realize is Isaiah is about Israel's rebellion and how judgment is called upon uh, uh, Isaiah by God, Asheria and Babylon who will later come and plunder Israel as a nation. Uh, and of course, on many occasions, there is a mention that the punishment on Israel is to purify, not to destroy, because there is continuous or constant prophecies about how Israel will be uh, restored. And so it is purification. So that is one of the contexts, uh, the larger context of Isaiah. Secondly, there is a regular mention of hope, even though there is punishment, even though there is discouragement through tremendous amount of suffering, there is hope of what? A future king through David's line. Very clearly it says that a shoot of Jesse will come out of the trunk which was cut. Once again, I'm, uh, uh, I'm not making reference to any of uh, the actual uh, uh, the story in Isaiah, but you will remember maybe some of them. This shoot of Jesse, whose name will be Emmanuel. And of course, we know who Emmanuel refers to, God with us. And finally, uh, new Jerusalem and the new creation. Uh, there will be a new king who will usher the fullness of the kingdom of God, where all nations of the earth will uh, be blessed. So if you look at the larger context of the book of Isaiah, this chapter sits very well with the uh, with the this context. This chapter, that is Isaiah fifty three, sits very well with this entire chapter, right? In it, in fact, enhances the flow of the story, and all the more reason for its prophetic nature for Jesus. Okay. One thing we keep in mind uh, with regards to one very strange aspect about what Isaiah prophesies with regards to Jesus, and that is how will this new king defeat evil? And very clearly, it is through suffering, not through violence. And of course, this will remind us of what Jesus himself said, quoting from John 18, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were my, sav my servants would fight violence to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now, my kingdom is from another uh, place. So this is the strange observation that is being made by Isaiah, that victory will be won through suffering and not through violence, right? So Jesus is presented as a complete and antithetical way of winning a victory, right? And this is even more proof that Isaiah 53 is talking about Jesus. This is the problem with the Jews. The Jews believe that the kingdom has to be established through force. But Jesus 
This Messiah says, no, that is not the way it is done. Right? So, it, John 18, very clearly, Jesus says that his kingdom is from another place, from another world. It's from another dimension or another ethic, a completely different moral order. Right? It does not correspond to this world. And hence, the very method of establishing the kingdom is also very different from how the world thinks of it. Right? And I'm just reminded of uh, what the prophet Zechariah says. Uh, not by might, nor all power, but by my spirit, right? God's kingdom is established not by might or power, but by his spirit. And, uh, uh, and if we can recognize who the spirit is and what the fruit of the spirit is, the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. This is... If you talk about all of this, it's failure, according to the world. But according to Jesus, it is success. According to God, this is what will help us succeed. Okay, so that is my brief introduction to uh, the, this chapter, Isaiah 53. Uh, now let's go into the actual chapter itself. But I am going to begin in Isaiah 52, the previous chapter, because there is a continuation of that. All right. We have to begin there. So Isaiah 52, and we'll begin from verse 13 and then get into Isaiah 53. I will be doing a lot of reading, so I hope you will uh, <laughs> uh, stay with me as I do that. And I'm going to pick up some thoughts from these readings so that uh, just to bring in some, a little bit more context and understanding to our, uh, our reading. Okay. Beginning in verse 13, notice it says, See, my servant will act wisely. He will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted. Just as there were many who were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any human being and his form marred beyond human likeness. So he will sprinkle many nations and kings will shut their mouths because of him. For what they were not told, they will see. And what they have not heard, they will understand. I'm sure you will recognize that, uh, especially verse 14, is a, a very, very strong connection to Jesus Christ. But it begins by saying, uh, see, my servant will act wisely. He will be raised and lifted up. Very clearly, this is applicable to a person. My servant. It's not talking about a nation. So that is one, uh, one thought we have to establish. It's talking about a person. Right. Um, he will be highly exalted. The word, the way this is shown that his exaltation is so high that it is characteristic of divinity. It is not characteristic of necessarily a person. Right. Or, 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 or a human. Now, of course, Jesus was a human, but he was also divine. He was fully God. So this exaltation is a reference to, de to, to deity, to divinity. And so very aptly fits with Jesus, right? And why the exaltation? Because of what, of how he has decided to uh, win the victory. The victory is won through suffering and uh, not through violence, right? Uh, and the suffering was so intense that it even disfigured him beyond recognition as it is mentioned in verse 14. Verse 15 talks about he will sprinkle many nations. Some believe that that is probably a not the best translation. Some would like to uh, insert the word startle, right? He will startle many nations, right? Why would many nations be startled by Jesus? Because of his sacrificial nature, his non-violent method and nature of struggle for victory. Nations don't recognize you know, non-violence. They, they have military and they have violence that they perpetrate. But Jesus would, you know, finally when he establishes his kingdom, nations will be startled that he has established, established it throughout uh, without violence. Right? Uh, and as it, uh, this is a fast forward to, you know, the future kingdom, the fullness of the kingdom, where all the nations will be dismayed. Now, if we stay with the word sprinkle, some believe that the word sprinkle could suggest 
that it is a metaphor for sprinkling of his blood to cleanse the nations. So he will sprinkle many nations, which would probably mean maybe he's referring to his blood. So both ways, it has a reference to the Messiah, that is Jesus Christ our Lord. All right. From here, we'll transition into chapter 53, beginning in verse 1, it says, Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? You remember, that was what we read, uh, uh, mentioned in the New Testament. All right. Verse 2, he grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty uh, or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. Who has believed it starts, verse 1. In other words, who would believe that God would save the world through such a person who would actually suffer to win the victory, right? That is what is uh, the, the, uh, the prophet trying to say, or God through the prophet trying to say, who has believed it? Um, you know, uh, how, how can we, uh, you know, it's such, a, it's, a, it's such a difficulty to believe of one who is not considered to be a great king. Jesus was not born as a king, but a suffering servant, right? A very humble beginnings. Uh, so it is antithetical, contrary to the ways of the world. And that is why the, the, the statement, who has believed, right? Uh, and so what does it say? It has to be revealed. Whom the arm of the Lord had, uh, you know, been revealed. In other words, this understanding comes through revelation, right? It cannot be reason as per the norms of this world, because this world cannot understand and believe. What the ways of, of God. Verse 2, very briefly, nothing that is naturally attractive or impressive about this Messiah. All right. Uh, what does, how does, how can we interpret that? We could say that that shows he was completely human. Right. There's nothing special about this person which very clearly shows he was fully human. And that's one of the Christian doctrines. You're 100% human. He was not a celebrity. He was not a superhuman. Uh, he didn't uh, look like, uh, you know, a, a superstar, but uh, he was just an ordinary person. Uh, and so uh, there was nothing that people should desire in him. Okay. Well, hang on. Uh, put on your seatbelts. We are going pretty fast now. All right. Let's move to verse 3. Verse 3 says, He was despised and rejected by mankind. A man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised and we held him in low esteem. You see, he gave himself to suffering and pain. This Messiah gave himself to suffering and pain. And it was more than physical pain. It was also psychological pain. It was mental pain. Uh, the fact that he was rejected, despised. You know, he was treated like a low caste or worse than a low caste, right? He was not appreciated by a world that is enamored by superhumans, right? Like, like in our celebrity culture today. He was treated so shabbily. Does that, does that not give us a reflection of how Jesus was treated? Right? Once again, these are all connections to Jesus the Messiah. And that is how... Uh, we, we, we make that conclusion. All right. Let's move on to verse 4 and 5. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered, considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds we are healed. Once again. This is quoted in the New Testament. Very clearly, if you look at verse 4 and 5, you will see the substitutionary nature of Christ's suffering. He's suffering for someone else, right? For others, not for himself. It is what we would call a vicarious atonement that he was uh, going through. He did for us, as we Christians would interpret it, he did for us what we could not have done for ourselves. I just want to spend a moment on this word punish, 
punished by God. Notice, it was as though we considered him punished by God, not that God was punishing him. And that, of course, is another controversy that many Christians keep fighting over, you know, back and forth. Uh, you know, there is uh, what we believe in GCI is that it's a wrong conclusion to make that Jesus is being literally punished by God. You see, the conclusion that some Christians make is that Jesus is, is being punished to appease God's wrath, right? It is to satisfy that Jesus was being punished by God to satisfy retribution and punishment for sin. So some would like to believe that Jesus dies because of God's justice. And hence, because of this, some atheists have taken this and called God a child molester or a child abuser. And that is the unfortunate thing, you know, that uh, sometimes our conclusions leads to a very wrong, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, belief by some others. I just wanted to mention that that is not how we would like to interpret this. You see, how could God punish someone for no fault of his? Right. Now that, of course, we know Now Jesus was, you know, taking the suffering on our behalf that we know. But who was actually punishing him? Was it God? Or was it the people? Consider that. Was it the people who were punishing him? They are the ones doing the beating and the crushing and the crucifying and the piercing, isn't it? Jesus bore the punishment which the people inflicted, inflicted on him. It is human wrath and anger that Jesus is being subjected to. Jesus dies because of human injustice. But in all of this, it was God's will, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, when I say God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, that Jesus would submit to human injustice. And through that, victory would be won. Unfortunately, the Jews did not recognize this. Now, they should have understood through the sacrificial system. They should have seen and known that uh, an innocent animal is dying on behalf of their sins. You see, that sacrificial system should have helped them to recognize that. But unfortunately, they were blinded or maybe they were deliberately blinded to the fact that Jesus was, uh, you know, was actually dying for them. And so by denying that, they wanted not to believe in Jesus. Okay, so that's uh, just a few thoughts about uh, these two verses. Let's move on. Verses 6 and 7. Where it says, we all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted. Yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before its shearers is silent. So he did not open his mouth. Once again, very clearly, the substitutionary, the vicarious uh, nature of this act of on, on behalf of Jesus. Uh, very, uh, very interesting that in verse 6 it says, uh, you know, we have to all turn to our own way each of us has turned to our own way it's a very good definition of sin this is one of the very good definitions of sin you know when we turn to our own way turn away from god that is perhaps a larger a larger perspective of sin sin is not just breaking the law but sin is having our own way right so when we want our own way god gives us over to our own choices and that is what we see in the world today Everybody lives by their own decisions and choices without any reference and regard to God. And so uh, that is the iniquity that we have all fallen into. If you will notice in verse 7, uh, the trial of Jesus Christ is probably mentioned there, uh, you know, uh, uh, in some detail there. He stayed quiet when Pilate was uh, questioning him. Lamb is an apt metaphor for Jesus. Uh, and when you say lamb, it also shows how it shows helplessness. Uh, he completely made himself so, 
you know, he, he submitted himself so much to the human injustice that he seemed so helpless. And yet it was we who are helpless, right? It is we who continue to struggle with helplessness. We can't help ourselves. And it was Jesus dying on our behalf to help us, you know, but he was depicting our own helplessness. And as it says, the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Well, once again, the, the Christian doctrine of grace and faith, we are saved by faith and grace because he has taken upon himself all of our iniquity. And hence, it is not by works that we are saved, but by the, uh, but by the act of, of Jesus Christ on the cross. Moving on, verses 8 and 9. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. Yet, who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was punished. Verse 9, he was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Notice it says, cut off from the land of the living. Very clear reference to his death. He literally died. As a human, he died. He was cut off from the land of the living. So that is clearly mentioned, uh, and that is a clear reference to his death. Right? Notice it also says in verse uh, 9, assigned a grave with the wicked. He was actually crucified like the wicked, like the two thieves, between the two thieves, and he was assigned like a criminal to die. Yet, when he was actually buried in a tomb, he was buried in a tomb of a rich person. Right? So uh, that is the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. Right? So very interesting detail. He was, you know, crucified as a criminal and assigned like a wicked person. And yet his tomb was in a rich person's, uh, you know, his grave was in a rich person's tomb. If I can just mention, he, it says he had done no violence. Once again, I think that is something we need to keep in mind. He does no violence. You see, violence is the essence of evil. He, the manifestation of evil is through violence. And Jesus had no evil in himself. God has no evil in himself. There is no violence in him. And hence we see so clearly the Messiah winning the victory without violence. And as we slowly come to the last few verses, let's move to 10 and 11. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. Verse 11, after he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Notice it says, it pleased the Lord to, uh, you know, crush him or bruise him. You know, uh, uh, it, 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 the word pleased, uh, some translation have pleased. Uh, here in this uh, NIV, it says it was the Lord's will to crush him. I think the Lord's will is much more better than Lord's pleased. Yeah. Some translation have it as pleased. Right? Uh, we can't say that God enjoys, you know, so it's so pleasing to him to, to put somebody, you know, into such suffering. Obviously, that is not uh, correct. But God has willed that suffering. Jesus himself has willed his own suffering. And that's a kind of pleasure for Jesus himself, that he was pleased to let himself be sacrificed. Okay. I also mentions in verse 10 that uh, it says he will see his offspring and prolong his days. Now, some people have taken that and said, oh, this cannot be Jesus because Jesus had no offspring. He did not marry and he did not have children. And so... Uh, the Islamic people and the Jewish people say, hence, this cannot be Jesus because this Messiah has offspring. But uh, <laughs> uh, uh, they don't see the metaphor there. 
These are his offspring by faith. He will birth many people into the faith. He will bring many people into belief and into the kingdom. In that regard, they are his children. They are his offspring. They are born again believers. That is how we Christians like to uh, like to interpret it, that, interpret that. And so uh, that is how we look at it. And notice in verse 11, he will see the light of life. Resurrection. He was cut off from the land of the living, but now he will see the light of life. Resurrection. He is alive again. You can imagine how closely it matches with the uh, with Jesus Christ, right? Finally, the last verse, verse 12. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great and he will divide the spoils with the strong because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors for he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. The many, you know, made intercession for uh, for the transgressors, uh, in other words, many who will be redeemed. The many will be redeemed. And the strong that is being mentioned, the spoils with the strong, perhaps a reference to those who resisted the devil and remained strong in the faith. Okay, so that is basically the, uh, the chapter, right? And uh, I hope you didn't, I didn't lose any one of you while uh, I, I was running through the, the verses. But let me just end before we open it up for some thoughts that we can share. Uh, just a reflection of what we just read. You know, it's always good for us to have, uh, bring some meaning to us personally. Right. Uh, we clearly identify Isaiah 53. Uh, that, that is a reference to Jesus Christ our Lord and his suffering. And the epitome, the epitome of this suffering. Uh, the suffering servant uh, is completely voluntary. Jesus says, I have given, I have decided to give my life. Right? Uh, it is voluntary on his part. Uh, nobody could force him. But he submits. He submits to human injustice. And so perhaps uh, one reflection we can take away from that, and you might have many more. The highest and holiest form of love is found in Christ's sacrifice. Right? As it says, greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. And that's Jesus himself saying, that is the highest and the holiest form of love. God decides to suffer so that we might be healed and we might become his offspring. And so perhaps just a thought to keep in mind, uh, that God manifests his highest form of love through Jesus Christ our Lord and we can thus have complete faith and trust in him. That's what I wanted to present to you. Uh, please feel free to uh, add any things that I may have left out. Like I said, there's much, much more to add, but then uh, I didn't want to burden you with too many peripheral details. I thought I'd just stick to the main thought. All right. All right, go ahead, guys. <laughs> I must say welcome to Doris and Bertram, who, Franklin, we missed you at the beginning, but thank you for joining us. Anyone uh, want to take up the controversy? Is it talking about the real Messiah or is it uh, a nation or are they two messiahs? <laughs> Jews like to deflect that, you know, away from Jesus. So perhaps I must mention the controversy about this regarding uh, Jesus not being the Messiah is actually uh, a thousand years after Jesus, actually. <laughs> If I can just mention that, you know, while you're thinking about uh, your comments. It was changed by a rabbi, Shlomo Itzaki, thousand years after Christ. Uh, and he is the one who said 
that uh, this is not referring to a person but a nation. Originally, uh, the scholars actually believed it was a person. But this man came and said, no, 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 it's not a person. Because people started believing that this was Jesus Christ, right? They wanted to sabotage the Christian message. Even Maimonides, one of the uh, foremost Torah scholars, uh, he says, originally it was a person. So it is inconsistent with the original messianic interpretation. So just a aside while you're thinking about that. Uh, Praveen, you want to go first or do you want to give Surya Murthy the, the comment first? Uh, Let Surya Murthy go. Oh. Surya Murthy, sir, you're on mute. Hmm. We say it is a prophecy or some person in the future. But why is it always using the past tense? The person who was reading it in the time of Isaiah, how would you understand it as a future thing? But the sentences are all, all past tense. Uh, I'm so sorry. I, I think I lost my connection. I am back. I, I, I'm sorry. I did not hear any comment being made. Uh, Praveen, did you hear that? And maybe you can just bring it up to speed. Uh, Mr. Suryamurthy was saying uh, uh, Isaiah was prophesying 500 years before Jesus Christ. How could he write all the text in past tense? <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, the person who was reading in the time of Isaiah, how would you say, think that it is talking about something which is going to happen in the future? Uh, okay. Uh, but, you know, in, in verse 2, he says, for he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root. So he's not talking about past, he's talking about the future. Okay. He was blue. He was stricken. All these are past tense. No, no. I mean, <laughs> that's a way of speaking. I don't know. Maybe, yeah, Monique can yeah. explain that. <clears throat> uh, that's a good point, Anil. You brought up, uh, you know, there is a future. See, uh, this, remember, is written in a poetic form. And I think maybe it is uh, written as like a song to be sung. And so... Maybe there is some poetic license there with regards to, uh, you know, it, it, uh, some reference or other it's referencing the past. But remember, the uh, judgment on Israel was future, right? Uh, they were going to be punished and that was yet a future event. And so I think it is a, it is a uh, literary, it, it is probably the literary style that is, uh, 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 you know, the uh, reference to the past, but it is actually prophetic. That, do I make sense? I don't know. Uh, Praveen, if you yeah. want to add something there. Yeah. Gone through this Isaiah 53 several times, but uh, I am unable to reconcile myself to the fact it is talking something about the future. He was okay. taken, he was taken, he was taken from prison and from justice. Okay. From the uh, land. Okay, let me ask you a question then, Suri Murthy. If it is past, what is it referring to? No. How, how would a person who uh, at the time of Isaiah would have understood it? When okay. it in the past, past tense. Yes. So, uh, if it is a past event, then the question, it begs the question, what is the past event? Was there a person? Or was it referring to some past uh, punishment? Obviously, it's not talking about a nation. So there, there is a problem. 
So if it is a future tense, it should be clearly it should clearly say it will, it will. See, that is where I think we have the literary issue. Maybe Praveen, you have any thoughts on that? Yeah. Uh, fortunately, it's been like, you know, just last week only I wrote a paper on the same subject. <laughs> <laughs> Good. <laughs> Um, so what I studied from class may be a kind of uh, use, I believe. Uh, here are a few things we need to consider. Number, especially as we are reading and studying Old Testament uh, prophecies, and especially when the New Testament author said, so-and-so scripture has been fulfilled. And so, so, so that the scripture may be fulfilled, kind of words we read in the New Testament. Uh, when we look at uh, Old Testament, there are various kinds of words. A lot of those things, we consider them as prophecies. And in in, in the category of prophecies, there are certain things. They are uh, like uh, predictions. Predictions mean, you, you all, we all know very well about what, what a prediction is. And number two category of things are promises. Promises also look similar to predictions, but promises are entirely different from predictions. So predictions are like they have only one kind of application. Whatever has been said in the same manner, it has to happen in the future. But when you talk about promise, it does not, it doesn't have to be exactly in the same form of, uh, you know, uh, it, it, it does not require to take the same form uh, which was explained in the words. Number two thing is when we talk about promises, it can have multiple fulfillments. A prediction can have only one fulfillment. A promise can have multiple fulfillments. Like for example, God said, I, Abraham, I will make you a great nation and I will give you the land. Uh, through you, I will bless all the nations. So giving children by the Isaac to an extent it was fulfilled. Next thing is when Israel was coming out of Egypt, he made them as a great nation. Another promise has been, I mean, another aspect of the promise has been fulfilled. And when they occupied the land, another aspect of the promise has been fulfilled. And through Jesus Christ, it, it is, it's fulfilled completely. Right? So a promise can have multiple fulfillments. A prediction can have only one, what? sorry, one uh, that is also specified way of fulfillment. Okay? The next thing is like uh, what uh, Eliza said uh, about the children who were uh, teasing him and all, you are going to die like this. And uh, so it literally the same thing happened. That is what prediction. But what we find in Isaiah, it is not a prediction. It is a promise that God had given. Even Isaiah chapter 6, ask unto the Lord for a sign and he shall give you. And that is again a promise. So uh, what we see in prophet, uh, prophet Isaiah prophecies is promise. So, this promise can have various fulfillments. Number one fulfillment is in his own history, in his own time. There will be a fulfillment, there will be an understanding for it. And in the time of Jesus Christ, there is another fulfillment. And by the time Jesus comes back second time, there are prophecies in Isaiah, they will be fulfilled by his second coming. So, there are fulfillment and these fulfillments, that we do not require uh, to say in this manner only it has to be. That is what surprised all the children of Israel also when Jesus uh, said he, the Messiah has to be suffered and killed and to be uh, resurrected from the dead. Disciples also could not take it. So this is one among those things. Having said that, uh, another thing we need to consider as we are talking about Isaiah 53, the suffering servant. Uh, the New Testament, in the New Testament, we understand none of the disciples, none of the Jews, were expecting a Messiah who is like a suffering servant. All of them were expecting for a Messiah who is going to be a military leader, charismatic leader, and who, who establishes the kingdom, throwing down Romans. That was the expectations of people. But how Jesus got a different perspective about this redeeming uh, the nation of Israel, that is through <laughs> Jesus' reading of Isaiah. Jesus' reading of Isaiah 53 was entirely different. The top, the word we say Messiah, Jesus never used the title Messiah for himself. Jesus always used the word Son of Man for himself. And he never used the word Messiah because it carries the baggage. 
people think the moment Jesus uses the word Messiah, people think he is going to wage a war against Rome. So he doesn't want them to misunderstand. That's why he never used that word. And in fact, he understood himself as son of man. And the son of man's ministry he understood by reading Isaiah 53 and various many of these chapters. In which, in Isaiah 53, there are various places where Isaiah uses the word Jacob, Israel. These words uh, you are referring for the nation. And these words he used for his servant. That is Jesus, as pastor has mentioned, the vicarious humanity of Jesus Christ. So, uh, Jesus also read this Isaiah, uh, like uh, in various places, there is, uh, he, he substituted himself in various places where there is Jacob and Israel. And he read those stories, sorry, he read those prophecies, and through which he understood the Messiah is going to be a suffering servant. And that is the same thing he started doing in his earthly life and in isaiah one thing is very clearly we can understand that is uh, 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 the, uh, the restoration of israel the restoration of israel according to isaiah is not going to come by bringing another cave by sorry by waging war against the kingdoms but the restoration of israel is going to come when israel suffers its the uh, uh, the consequences for its sin and it faces judgment and then God's grace through which Israel is going to be redeemed. That is the theme in entire Isaiah and Jesus put himself in the place of Israel as a vicarious human and he thought through his suffering, death, burial and resurrection Israel is going to be redeemed. That's how he brought forth his uh, understanding of ministry completely through book of Isaiah. And uh, coming to the question, past tense and these words we are talking about, uh, the Messiah, what he is going to do and all. If you talk, actually, even Isaiah was not thinking about some kind of Messiah who is going to come either through <laughs> waging what they are going to ready Israel. None of these. Isaiah has been written, it's divided into three parts. The last part is the time when the Israel almost lost its power, they don't have anything. The, since then, People started getting these ideas about someone who is going to come charismatic leader, throws down the empire and going to establish. But that is not the thread we find in entire Isaiah. The thread we find in entire Isaiah is Israel is going to suffer for his sins, face judgment and resurrect, uh, saved by the grace of God and which God is going to accomplish, he himself is going to accomplish through his servant. That is Jesus, the same thing Jesus said and has accomplished in the first century. Does it make any sense? Mm. Well, the, uh, yeah, the, uh, the wordings are such that, uh, you know, I mean, if, even if you look at Psalm 22, which is a messianic, uh, you know, chapter, of course, David is the one who is reciting it and it's applicable to him, but it is also written in the past tense but it has a future reference. So there is a, a similar play there. If you read Psalm 22. Right? Uh, one single thought I would like to share as we are talking about these. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, you rightly mentioned uh, Psalm 22. There are a lot of scriptures, especially when in the birth, during the birth of Jesus Christ also, uh, where, uh, where Jesus went to Egypt and then was coming back. So Matthew quotes, uh, he shall call his servant from Egypt. Uh, that is the words um, Matthew said. Certain places, in one place it is written, Jesus said, I am thirst. So the author takes and says, Jesus is thirst. He said that so that the scripture may be fulfilled. Okay. So what is that? Jesus is thirsty and he said, just I am thirst. What, what is there to say? Scripture is fulfilled. Such a adding such big words to it. Some kind, some kind of uh, statements, they sound ridiculous to us. Uh, but actually, uh, the authors of, uh, when these kind of quotes are there, the authors of the Gospels, what they understood was that Jesus is the Messiah and he is the Son of God. And in their theme, as they're trying to explain that Jesus is the Messiah, they are taking various Old Testament quotes, like, uh, as I said, he shall call his servant out of Egypt. It is talking about Israel, bringing Israel out of Egypt. 
the exodus case but here we are bringing the same thing so that people may not reject jesus came from egypt so jesus messiah cannot come from egypt messiah has to be from jerusalem and they may re try to reject that is the reason the authors of the gospel they used <coughs> these for number one is to prove that jesus is from jerusalem and then he came from egypt but still see in the scripture he brought his servant out of egypt so in order to support them they used various scriptures so many of them we find even from i book of isaiah the authors of the gospels have used to prove that jesus is the messiah i think all we can uh, with regards to that all we can uh, do is to believe jesus because he himself referred to it <laughs> and uh, philip preached <laughs> philip preached about jesus from this from isaiah 53 so that is that is uh, proof enough that it was referring to jesus yes anil go ahead but regarding uh, <clears throat> surya murti said that uh, how were the people in those days expected to understand this when uh, they were writing all this in the past or something like that but doesn't it say somewhere in the new testament that these you know these were written but not for their understanding because they could have never understood this but for understanding in our times yeah doesn't it say so somewhere so i mean basically yeah this they could could not have understood until the new testament times right i think i don't know if it was paul or peter who says that yeah. even the even the prophets wanted to yeah. you know wanted to know but they could not Correct. So that's what I was referring to. Yeah, right. I can't remember the which exact scripture mm -hmm. it is, but uh, but yes, even probably Isaiah didn't understand what he was writing. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Right. I don't know if that helps Surya Murthy, but uh, uh, the last sentence which he spoke uh, very much, I understand that even mm -hmm. Isaiah could not have understood what he wrote. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <Of course>. Okay. <laughs> well that proves the point <laughs> all right well i guess uh, time has just uh, moved on any other thoughts any comments uh, otherwise uh, thank you so much for joining us again and uh, we hope that we can continue to meet on this platform god bless you all and uh, let's go ahead and close in prayer uh we see uh, uh i think uh, reka would probably do the honors for us today <laughs> you'll have to unmute yourself reka dear father almighty god we come before your royal throne trying to understand all these wonderful things and marvels that you are showing us father we don't completely understand this we it seems like the tip of the iceberg but you oh god have called us and helped us father in our in our journey we are really grateful for this uh, platform that we learn so many wonderful things father please help us to appreciate and be grateful for all that you give us father and please help all our people who all over the world who are trying to understand and come before you you are the light of the world father and so please help us to appreciate every day that is there so thank you father for this wonderful uh, bible study that we have every wednesday please open our minds and hearts to your great truth every day and please bless the people here father we ask your blessing now in jesus holy name amen, amen and god bless you all have a good rest of the day <laughs>